I'm really excited to be introducing our next speaker, a poet, Lyrae Van Cleef Stefanon. Lyrae Van Cleef Stefanon is a poet and an associate professor of English at Cornell University. I guess I can take this off now. Where she teaches creative writing and poetry, African American literature, and Southern literature, among other topics. Her book, Open Interval, was a 2009 finalist for the National Book Award and the LA Times Book Prize. Her work has appeared in such journals as African American Review, Callaloo, Crab Orchard Review, Gulf Coast, and Shenandoah, and in the anthologies of Bush, sorry, Bum Rush the Page, Roll Call, Commonwealth, Gathering Ground, and The Ringing Ear, Black Poets Lean South. Welcome, Lyrae. I'm so honored to be included in this, um, in this gathering and celebration of Julie's work and all of your all's hard work, too. I'm going to read some poems. I'm going to try not to do banter between them. Eclipse. Oh, when the moon goes down in blood. A period is a pebble, a rock that blocks a ray, a ray's my heart. A beat beat in my ears, a chorus thud of marching boots, a crunch from which my eyes flee. Blaze, the gaze lifts, then ellipses. A wobbling slip towards strabismus, cloisters, the cellular's locatable may, alas, the signals scrambled. These devices, idolem, where am I? In a book, in a bath, in a claw foot tub, claw hammering in a past moment, in a current set, afloat on the edge of insight, an un uncooperative vision. A black body wrapped in a white towel, anxious to reveal, then abandon. In unison, can you tell me how to get back to the sentence so I can serve it? There, a period is an embolus, a ticking clock, a bumba clot, a green fuzz tennis ball struck with such force, who almost sees stars? Who's almost lost from whose lack of listening? Girl, adrift on an ocean, not always the Atlantic, easing the mind of a woman looking toward a child across the way. No one is white here. Only the towel is white. Lay it on the sand, lie down and relax. I would end here, except the periods full of blood. The towels soaked, the sand, the stone, the whole sea been gone red. Blooming. Try to spell the teeth sucking sound. Sound that shoots the eyes right, sidelong toward the edge of a field. Vision branched into full, flowering, then drags the eyes back as swift, alert toward witness. The margin, people, leafy here. Don't say community like that. Don't say communion like that. Don't say communist like that. Here, efflorescing like sound that is unspellable. Spit pull and air's edge against the enameled walls inside one's maw. Sound, fritz, bites, soothes, sedge. A yellow field breathing space, roots. To breathe is to heal. What a body might do in a field with a breath. To frit is to begin to prefuse sand and flux, but push the breath hard enough through, and it is 
to call the dogs or to call attention to. St. John's wort, the sedge in this wild blooming. How bored of dull walls of every sort I am. A frustration of flowers pulled back over the tongue and stopped against the wall behind the teeth, a hiss that is a click. An image shuddered, a story the eyes shot. Someone placed a skull in the middle of a field. I'm stumbling through a commission, this still life. I can't finish until I invent a way of spelling an upside down T, a row of S's sucked backwards to a thick-tongued stop, like someone's snapped. A picture I don't want to describe. The skull, the wall. Let the T stand for tool. Let the T stand for tag. I'm it. Commit. Let T stand for the work T does in try. Teeth. Shoot, frit, witness. Careful you don't end up in the Chattahoochee, my mother warned me. I am trying here not to open my mouth. Your heart knows where home is, Grandma reminded me. Understand what happens when a sound opens. If by assessment you mean how will I measure when I have sounded the proper spelling, what does it mean to thrive? I miss the gold that glinted in my mama's mouth and the gold that glinted in grandma's mouth. Their sudden smiles, glorious mischief. Two women no kin to one another for whom witness meant to tell an old, old story. Notice the sedge, its structure. What if the T, what if the work T does in notice? The structure, Aaron Kaima, if the whole fails, let me had been breathing. Structure, if I fails, I am still the work T does in delight, theirs, Florida baby girl and Appalachia grandbaby. I am still gleaning in grandma's, that's St. John's wort, gold, and mama's, look at God, glint. A simple gift, a breathless glimpse. Slumber. The left eye is darkening, blear, a heavy welling, nothing stare, hooded droop with pupil lift, not squint but sharp cornered, almond shape, paired to slit, drug eye, nick bruised beneath, dragging the last of contempt from couldn't care less. The right eye is art. An other world, aftershock, x-ray, blast, white with a white ring, ultra open iris, tear stripped, a dark drop clings to bottom rim, impossibly, pupil dangling at lash line as if prepared reversibly to slide back up to faded horror. No bridge separates left from right, no thing where nose would be if face to keep white gate from swallowing the dark edge, a canoe pulled towards a whirlpool. In the center of the drift above the closet, the board described does not dream. Dead tree, a knot is not a dream. Two knots burled over boudoir, do not sweep in rapid eye to mind a sleeper streaming 
a film lilting about her, a lullaby, surveillance, a rock burst, the trees stop, a beam from which the words purged, a branch felling the forest, a blanched refrain from slumber, knotted, grain sliced, cut, cut. What sweetness, another state is, stealing from her. Trespass. Trust eludes us still nine months in where time, the inventive, trips on untrust what ifs in a half in tiptoe stint where a turkey high steps across the tan and green field again. This morning's small joy, scrambling thoughts on time in the bland pandemic where Cue the kazoo. It has already been three weeks, five days, 10 minutes, and a second turkey, jerk necking its panic pomp sprint, tracking up my soundtracked meditation on trespass. I keep turning up tracks toward forgiveness, listening for forgiveness, but the skipping replay disrupts. What a joke they were, herky humping toward the dry brush as if they had already heard their own deaths waiting, where but cocked there in the morning's hard silence. And I think I'm gonna end. I don't know what the time is, and so I think I'm gonna end maybe with this last one because I'm running out of time. Okay, um, and this is for anybody who breaks out in hives. Um, my body has been sending me all kinds of like strange signals. I break out in hives. Sometimes I went for a while where I was breaking out in hives every day for about six months. And when I have hives, they're dramatographic. Anybody else have dramatographic hives? Yeah, yeah, so dermatographia. A strange sensation announces the hives. Already I have failed to catch the truth as sometimes it's my eyes that bank them first. What are these lines and when did they appear? A question in pentameter, the truth reveals a rhythm in itself. My skin questions language. What do you say about this scrawl? My skin commands, make no declaration outside the field of wonder. Intimate instead of true despair, the way someone's ex-lover this moment turns over the word ghost. Again, I have failed. The despair is mine and ghosting an arrival grooves on my thigh. Who has been touching me, I wonder. All week this week I've told myself no one touches. I have stopped to run my hand over my leg. I have stopped just short of tears, a different river, this stop flow happening in 2021 and here it occurs is the apt description, the one that feels closest to sensation. Imagine standing in a river. How would it feel if suddenly all of the water stopped? The hives rise, suggest themselves as patterns on my thigh, a rill, a runnel touch, a channeled stutter over skin. This is what it feels like when nobody is close. How I feel it, this troubled ghosting. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Lorraine. It was beautiful. Wait, where did you go? Oh, you disappeared. Thank you so much. Um, for the afternoon, our first group panel is called Sense and Subjectivities, and we have a really incredible group of people ranging from various different disciplines to present. Um, the way that we thought about this panel was really through Julie's encouragement of expanding out of the kind of purely fine art realm into poetry, into music and jazz, into the sciences, um, into film, and this panel is really indicative of that. Um, the people that I'm about to introduce are all situated in each of those areas. Um, I will introduce them in order of their appearance. We will start with the esteemed Robin Costi Lewis. She is the Poet Laureate of Los Angeles. In 2015, her debut poetry collection, Voyage of the Sable Venus, won the National Book Award in Poetry. Um, her writing has appeared very widely, various journals and anthologies, Time, The New Yorker, The New York Times, Paris Review, et cetera. Woman of the Year Award from LA County in 2018. I like that one. <laughs> in addition, she has taught at many different institutions and she is currently at work on two forthcoming collections to the realization of perfect helplessness and prosthetic. Second, we will have Kojo Ashun and Anjali Segar who will be presenting together. Kojo is a filmmaker, theorist, and artist based in London, a lecturer in contemporary art theory at Goldsmiths, University of London, and professor of visual art at the Haute École d'Art et Design in Geneva. He's the author of numerous books, including More Brilliant Than the Sun, Adventures in Sonic Fiction, and has contributed to a wide range of publications. In 2002, he and Anjali founded the Otolith Group. They were nominated for the Turner Prize in 2010 and have exhibited internationally since 2003. Anjali Segar also lives and works in London. She studied social anthropology at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, and received her MFA from Middlesex University. Her work includes film and video compositions, curatorial projects, moderation, production, and she's interested in the relations between sound, text and image, archive, and the legacies and potentials of the essay film. After them, we will, oh, you know, I might have gone out of order, I'm really sorry. Fumi Ohiji um, will be going before them. She is an assistant professor of rhetoric at UC Berkeley, author of Jazz's Critique, Adorno and Black Expression Revisited, and arrived at the Academy by way of the London jazz, jazz scene in which she took an active part as a vocalist and an improviser. She works across Black studies, critical theory, sound and music studies. Her research and teaching looks to Black expression for ways to understand modern and contemporary life which is to say she explores works and practices for what they can provide by way of social theory. She's currently focused on a second book project tentatively entitled Billy's Bent Elbow, The Standard as Revolutionary Intoxication. She is a member of Le Mardi Gras Listening Collective, a group of friends who, whenever possible, study, listen to music, and eat good food together. And finally, we have Dr. Charles Zucker, who is a molecular geneticist and neurobiologist. He's a professor of biochemistry and molecular biophysics and of neuroscience at Columbia University and a principal investigator at Columbia's Zuckerman Institute. He's been an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute since 1989, studied biology at the Catholic University of Valparaiso in Chile, attended graduate school at MIT, and prior to coming to Columbia in 2009, he was the Kevin and Tamara Kinsella Chair of Neurobiology and Distinguished Professor at UC San Diego School of Medicine. So please join us on the stage. Um, and I should mention Kojo and Anjali are joining us virtually from respectively Berlin and Greece. Um, so they will not be here with us physically, but we will see them on the screen. But Robin, Fumi, and Charles, if you'd like to join us on the stage, please do. Thank you so much. Lord have mercy. Julie Maretu, who the hell are you? Look at this room, y'all. Who are you? This is so special. Um, when I was preparing and thinking and reading about everything, I was like, in some part in my heaven, there is a room that looks just like this with just these people. I'm very honored to be here. Um, I'm just gonna jump in. Oh wait, before I do, so partly why I'm very emotional, about, very emotional about you all and being here and Julie and your incredible exhibit um, 
is also because of the context in which it's taking place in Manhattan at this time, we have lost a lot of people again. Um, Julie and I and a, a several of the people in this room have been talking over the year about how much um, the COVID quarantine reminds of all, of all those we lost from AIDS and HIV and how here we go again. And I was going to talk about those people before I jumped in who we all have lost, but let's just send our love to them. Um, and instead, I want to talk about someone we have not lost, but who should have been celebrated in the past year, but was not because of the quarantine, and that is Thelma Golden. Can we just celebrate her? <laughs> Thelma, under quarantine, celebrated her 20th year as the director of the Studio Museum. And it went pretty much un unnoticed because we were all in a state of trauma. But uh, Christine, thank you for pointing out all the crossroads in this room that have Thelma Golden at the center of them. So I just want to send out my love to her and my gratitude to her. Um, I've recently completed a text and image book project called To the Realization of Perfect Helplessness. This photograph presumably was taken by my grandmother, Dorothy Mary Cosney Thomas Brooks. I found it along with hundreds of other photographs from daguerreotypes to Polaroids in a suitcase under her bed just days, be days before her house was to be demolished to create a church parking lot in Los Angeles. I should say I found them in 1997. My project that I've been working on for 25 years is an attempt to reframe both her collecting and photographic practice as an archive of global black artifacts. We can speak more about this through the day or the evening as we mingle, but for brevity's sake, I'd like to do what my father often said to us when we were in trouble, I can show you better than I can tell you. The title, however, is from uh, the great black Arctic explorer, Matthew Henson. Henson had just seen, um, Henson, I'm sorry, I, I can't see you. Oh, that's why I don't have the right glasses, sorry. Um, I just need to check in for a minute. You guys, um, this is not gonna be projected live, so I wanna apologize to the audience. I'm sorry, we're still processing the archive and their legal and ethical reasons about why we can't um, stream them. So, but you'll see them soon in the next year, okay? Um, in any case, okay, so um, Henson had just seen yet another of his beloved, uh, beloved friends killed in a storm as they trekked onward north towards the pole. A boulder hit his friend dead in the chest, and this, to the realization of perfect helplessness, is how Henson described his predicament. To me, it seems apt. So you guys have to be patient with me because I'm working on a computer while they're working. Thank you guys um, for supporting me in this project. Um, the text I'm going to read is an excerpt from a project I, Julie and I have been working on. The text part of it I've titled Intimacy for Julie. Um, I don't think I want to say more about that now, except that the project gave me a door into thinking about vernacular black photography in a way that I've been waiting for, for 25 years. I wouldn't write the book. I kept saying, I have to cut my teeth. I had to cut my teeth some more on some other projects that I didn't want to pretend that I knew what I was looking at when I looked at my grandmother's archive. So uh, this is an excerpt from a much larger project that Julie and I are working on called Intimacy, and the photographs are from my grandmother's archive. Forgive me. Well, I manifest both. I think they thought at some point that I would come back home. I think I thought so too. Luckily, I know it by heart. Do the tambourines miss us? signs and marks, and nothing with which to apprentice them. Evolution, the migration of imagination, the image just illusion, a profound prehistoric technology of leaving. Minute anchors, something to hold on to, not rational, a private moment, no air, 
the evolution of human beings making marks, the paintings watching us, an army of black holes advancing. The very, very first person, the very first human beings. The ones who crossed over long before the ice age, before the last three ice ages, before the ones before that too. Must we see ourselves in the water? Must the water be still? And didn't we know all this was going to happen? Didn't we feel it all those decades ago, standing together, talking on the sidewalk? I remembered you then, not from the past, but from an inkling inside my body that some would later call the future. Some part of me expected you, knew you would arrive, faceless, open, hungry. And how the words felt then in our mouths, all those small-minded Englishes we refused to speak and all the countless blacknesses we could. The body was our archive. Desire was our breastplate. There was a well-known Derg saying once, to catch the fish, you dry the sea. You were only four then, running along the bottom of the ocean. We were running underwater in the opposite direction. Land is secondary. I was four then too. A history of alienation, perhaps. Perhaps I just needed to take the future off the table. Devotees of black absence, disciples of the immeasurable. Like the ochre painting you left for me, sitting and waiting inside an abalone shell 73,000 years ago. Time, a little girl running backwards wearing a bark dress. What then is a moment? Embodiment, when there is no other word to say but yes. Yes. Intimacy, cell to cell. Do you ever wonder who made the first brick, the first needle, the first spoon? I was on the ark with you. I was the hull. I was the flood, too. Every morning lately, after a night of lucid insomnia, my first thought is always the same. 14 billion years. Our planet began 14 billion years ago. I just lie there, thinking. Then I move slowly forward, millennium by millennium, trying to see everything that has taken place until I arrive to the present moment, me lying in my bed. Lately, I think about all of the other humans now extinct whose DNA spirals inside of our own DNA. Then I remember that we will one day soon be extinct too, 14 billion years. I'm terrified by the idea of my own death, but I scoff at the idea of four tiny centuries. I'm sorry, I'm waiting for the, it's not changing, forgive me. Sometimes, instead of going forward, 
I try to go further back, beyond 14 billion years. I try 15 billion, 16 billion, 60 billion, long before our planet was ever created. Sometimes a small girl in me wonders if all of our universes are a roux roiling inside a, la a large stone cauldron, inside the warm midnight blue kitchen of the infinite black sorceress alive inside my cells. Sometimes I can't stop thinking about the fact that before Mao Zedong became a genocidal murderer, he was first a librarian. Quantum entanglement. Something female inside me knows that she is evolutionarily expected to wake up in the middle of the night and stare through the dark and wonder, all the world spinning beneath me, toggling. I have been thinking about you again today as I do so often think of you wondering if people can see the sky of our childhood the way we still see the sky whenever we think of each other. Well, not see, but feel, the way every feeling has a trillion eyes. There are days when all I want is to hold your hand and walk down Wilmington Two girls who can feel all the galaxies inside them and no one to understand or even fathom that our minds have sprinted far past them, that while they insist on our drawing and redrawing the first three letters of the alphabet, that we, like all the other children here, can already see the planet's arc and all her invisible, perfect geometries of which you and I sitting here now make three. White space, black stars. I am sharpening my arrows naming each point after the dead. The only language I have is language. Like the ancient technology a scientist discovers in the interior design of a fossil shell and then replicates in a factory, a shape and function that makes a whole industry turn. That is pleasure. 40,000 years ago, there wasn't a continent that had not borne our footprint. The mother, the daughter, the Holy Spirit. Holy rascal, first teacher, sacred door. The way that women fold out into the universe, the way it folds back into us, the way we disappear and reappear, the way we hide our feathers, the way we swallow our beaks, the way we bite down, the way that love says no. the way it sometimes whispers, yes. The way a woman steps towards me and her steps pry me open. The way if I look into her, she steps back. The question always lack. The way we open, the way we close, too soon, too late, and then reverse it the way we close too soon and open way, way too late. 
the old stories still alive inside us, the old ways just waiting, our gardenia corsage, a pearl engagement ring, swinging a tea strap to and fro your arm around me, sitting on a park bench together that very first time we saw the sea. The way that I can never leave. and still stand in wonder. The night. The day. The way I went to sleep with one face and awoke the next morning with another. The way you walked into our room and said nothing, never mentioned it. The way you still recognize me. The way we rode through that ancient desert that night, hour after hour, the lush and endless darkness. The way our eyes knew to adjust to the pitch black. The ways we began finally to see. The way we held each other's hands and the kind men who drove us in their Jeep. Your father had died. And the stars, the stars. The way time keeps knocking on my bedroom door the way that death lets her in, the way that life pours the tea. Only love can wear the crown. I want to see everything. I want to step inside once again. For those in the back who can't see the text, it says, we wish for maps that have, never been, that have never existed, that will never exist. I touch myself with history. And there is reason for great caution when the company of paragraphs. The house, a parking lot, the tree, a wall, the foundation pickpocketed by God, the self, soot. Turn the ocean on. My body, a constantly ripening orchard seen only by satellite, satellites. Yes, it is possible to be in ecstasy while burning in hell. Just be here with me on this page. Do the tambourines miss us? I am trying to make the gods happy. I am trying to make the dead clap and shout. Thank you. I don't think I'd be able to have the mind or imagination I have, however strange it might be and odd and queer, as Baldwin once said when they asked him, you're queer, you're black, you're born poor, you poor thing. And he said, on the contrary, I hit the jackpot. So in closing, I want to read a poem also from the project I'm reading, uh, I'm writing for Julie, with Julie. Um, I need to tell you a couple of things about it. It's a quick sonnet, so we'll take 30 seconds once I introduce it for one minute. Uh, Volta, quick, a quick poetry professor lesson. If you guys don't know Volta, besides being a magnificent river that goes through the continent, um, in poetry means the turn. 
And in a sonnet, it, it takes place about two thirds of the way through eighth, ninth line, where the poet will turn on themselves and stop fucking around, basically, and start telling the truth of the poem, right? Um, that's the black way of saying it, which I think is the best way. But they, you know, <laughs> but they say they 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 describe it in all ways, you know, like it's a moment of vulnerability, yada yada yada. Okay, but. Um, Julie and I in our conversations, and I didn't say this, but I meant to say, have been talking a lot about time. And for me, time is the greatest colonizer, right? The, I, the notion of Western time. And so I've been spending, it's really, it's really easy to forget that there are so many beautiful, extraordinary artworks in, throughout the continent in so many countries of early humans making art. 70,000 years ago, 80,000 years ago, 120,000 years ago. You never hear about it because we're not supposed to hear about it. And so it's been amazing doing this research on early human evolution and then looking in books and it's like, you know, let's go, 30,000, 40,000. And it's just, it, you know, it is what it is. Time is a site of colonization too, it's a short version. So I wrote this poem for Julie. Thank you for having me. Volta, Still Bay. Blombos Cave, South Africa. It's for you too. I want to enact the middle turn right here. I want this beginning to be their end and this ending our arrival. Hot flare. That screen door on Central Avenue, mouth of a cave I would one day walk through, map of rhyme syllables imploding inside my head. Predictions of experience exact. The white atlas mute, a black code of terror, unmoored, unbelonging. I don't need to wait for the turn. I turned 73,000 years ago. The first ocean covered with flat moments that came and then melted. Pleasure, continents. This is just the scent of our trail, the edge, the trace. Thank you. So uh, it's really great to be here. Um, thanks so much for, for Julie and Megan for uh, inviting me. Um, it's been a really lovely experience to think alongside uh, Julie's work um, and to, to hear from my fellow contributors today um, and to share with you. Uh, so what I'm about to present, to share, um, is an in-process progress bit that I've been writing in conversation with the exhibition. Um, the thinking is a, a pressure testing of an alternative notion of the standard. Um, and I've been thinking about the standard in jazz uh, as a forum of sociality, as a, a collection of contributions to the composition that we usually understand as the standard. Um, in this piece, I'm talking specifically about what I'm calling the non-sensuous standard. Uh, and this is a, a modality of the standard in which the contributing parts do not necessarily sound or look like one another. I'm thinking about the non-sensuous standard as a way to understand something about black, queer, and abstract or abstraction Perhaps more, most importantly, I'm interested in understanding the resounding sociality of the black abstract. So it's about 10 minutes long. A standard lies beyond communication, but it is nevertheless a banner waving us down, interrupting our banter, squat but protruding top petal or better, an undulating, many-pointed, and a fractious vexillum. A brushed thing, barely touched, pointed thing, the point, the matter at hand, which is us together, just so, for a while. Over the other side of family resemblances and material similarities that gather us around a progression, a lyric, a color, an idea even, is what Walter Benjamin calls Verwandtschaft, that is relationship, affinity, connection, kinship. They're ways to each other, these works, 
by sensuous experiments. Their gossip and how they are to get to the point is what they talk about, is all we can talk about, really. But it seems to me that they move in this way with the intention, the devoted patience and attention to happen upon a non-sensuous standard, their kin. This gathering, we are told, is not comprehended by reason, but by a feeling. Their kinship, not so inevitable, certainly not accountable, but adoptive and felicitous. They may look and sound like one another, and yet resemblance does not need to appear where there is kinship. Benjamin's relationship is a kind of kinship that not so much survives the middle passage, not so much survives the separation, the imposition, but rather emerges as that which is most at ready at hand for them. There is no need to set aside any um, genetic identity or disposition. Kinship cannot be determined or evidenced. It can only be felt. We may say, we might say that both, we might say both that the paintings black and African resemble one another, hold an undeniable sensuous similarity, and that their kinship can only be grasped as a feeling. Julie says her paintings hold one another, not as siblings, but as other kin. Their connection that we from the outside cannot quite comprehend. Schemata, marks, layer, layers, paintings in search of something together, quadrants of affinity, makeup and mounds, today's disco eyeshadow and staves hidden beneath expression and phrase, the salty shade, there's no mistaking that she is an intriguer, but she must have approached these paintings with such assiduous care, approached the matter of their possible kinship only obliquely, improvising parts, setting up games and obstacles for them to get lost in one another. Their dragon, scribble, and trawl, hewed, hewed and chipped items, guided line and curved, arrayed in order that they might fall into one another, fall upon that feeling that we fascinated audience participants of these epic planes of standard might fall also, as if monument could be folkic, monumental orality, monumental small talk. This, this standard is often stumbled upon, sorry, it's gonna, this standard is often stumbled upon as the paintings and their marks convene around their shared lamentation. How to make the changes, how to interpret the lyric, how to stay alive, how to get together. But this performance is also their raison d'etre. They come together around some matters, but most importantly, they want to make music, which is to say they want Verwandtschaft, they're saying something is vehicle for this. We know they've made it only by way of a feeling. Lament that the mournfulness is to be heard, that the emotional cycle ends in musicality, the musicality of painting, painter, and viewer, indicating the concert of the pieces, that the feeling of relationship presents as musicality is all significant, I think. The music is a feeling of relationship. In Julie's handling of sensuous material, her dealing with matters at hand, there is much, often generative, discontinuity and antagonism. But as Benjamin uh, discovered in his morning play, we find in these paintings coming together that the redempt redemptive mystery is music, the rebirth of a perflora of emotion in supersensuous nature of musicality. The suggestion that lament characterizes our coming together, our non-sensuous similarity, that our kinship aside from any family resemblances hits, hits me hard. Our family resemblances are not all that superficial though. Our talent for seeing and producing an assortment of mimetic things and portals our obsessive search for kinship is not superficial. It's a fascination with the way, with form, the way we come together, the sociality of it all that dis 
distinguishes our abstract. The there I go, there I go, and saying it over and over again with James Moody and Coltrane. Yes, we are pulled toward and apart by lamenting relationship, but our way with the material shows a complex of play with similarity and correspondence and talk that perhaps our kinship, as beautiful and desirous as it is, is just an excuse for. When you're wounded kin, when you've been lost to one another, resemblances are never trivial. When you manifest in 3D, a bent note remo removed, blue, red eyes, anaglyphic, together an embossed look, raised re relief, unbroken wave, resemblance can become a country, can be worldlike even, an irreal non-actuality in anticipation of complete communion. Our anticipatory action to a retroactive call is not at all trivial. Our relationship on one hand and our shared mimetic fascination toward kinship on the other are means towards each other. I've been thinking about Nina Simone's remark at the end of her 1976 set at the Montreux Jazz Festival and her claiming for rhetorical effect to not being able to fathom the conditions that produce a situation in which we need to deny our feelings, our kinship. The conditions that produce a situation could be understood as an attenuation of possibility to only what is actual. The limiting of possibilities to potentialities already sanctioned by the actual. Those conditions straighten the course of this world. It is, of course, the same state of affairs that makes it easier for us to contemplate the end of the world than it is to imagine a blackened one. To spin, to spin Claudia Rankin's aphorism, indexing the white man's supposedly wild imaginations and black death, I offer that it, it is because the West is compelled to police its imagination that the earth and its people and its flora and fauna are dying. This world that valorizes the actual feels crushing despair in the face of our possibility, suffers acute anxiety when met by walking, talking contradictions that, condition its, that conditioned its founding. Confrontation with the relative ease and proficiency in dealing with uncertainty must be experienced as an affront. The impulse is toward urgent resolution the possibilities of us must be crushed with maximum force. To face an army of crouching and squatting ladies of um, avions of the bottom right variety must be terrifying. It is because we are mere abstract formal possibility, because we are in existence without actuality, because we cannot or cannot police our semblance cannot or will not actualize our fantastic everyday indeterminations, our this way and that, multi-perspective modality, our reverie in goodness. It is because of our irreverence towards necessity, rendering us ultimately ungovernable, ultimately unteachable, that the world wills our passing. To question the necessity of the conditions that produce the situation of endemic coldness makes one dangerous. To set forth a long song of our non-citizenry, to outline the topography of that liminal living of a black city, to invite the intoxication of a black dash African country is world quaking. Thank you. Hello there. I believe we are live now. Um, excuse, excuse the dark room. I'm in uh, Greece, um, in an island which is very wild. Actually, it's an island of deported communists. Um, and I'm in a back room of a restaurant, which they've given me because the internet is really bad. So there's not much light. Um, I'm just explaining why I'm in the 
I'm not actually in the dark, but the light isn't actually shining on me. So, um, Kojo, would you like to begin? Okay. Um, can everyone hear me? Maybe put a sign in. There. Yes, I think. Okay, so. fantastic. Yeah, they can and hear you. Anjali, do you want to say something? Can yeah. everybody hear you? Yes, I think everybody can hear me too. Okay, because um, I can't hear you. So that's quite disconcerting. Oh. oh. Um, um, okay. well, can everybody hear me? Best, all the, I can't actually hear anyone at all. Okay, they can hear me. Uh, that's very strange. Okay, Maybe so we're going to try our best just uh, put your, to uh, read text that we've written of together for this occasion. Um, mm. The idea was we were going to read um, sections. So I think what we'll do is when we read, when I finish a section, I'll send a note to Anjali saying, saying yes, or finished. And then you take over. And then when you finish, you send something to me, right? Because otherwise we don't know when we've read our sections. Or we'll just, yeah. So let's do that. So let's start. Okay. So um, so my name is Kojureshan. Um, I'm one part of the Ottolith group. I'm here with my colleague and collaborator and fellow artist of the Ottomans group, Anjali Kasaga. Anjali is in Greece, I'm in Germany, and we're uh, talking to you at the Whitney. Um, we wish we could be there with our dear friend, Julie Moretti, but um, it's a pleasure for us to be invited to this conference, um, this event, Black Oblique Slash Queer Oblique Slash abstract. Um, it's a pleasure to be invited to um, speak about um, senses and subjection. Uh, although I have to admit what we've written really works better in relation to um, questions of blackness and abstraction because they are really an extension of, um, of a conversation that uh, Julie and myself and Darby English and a number of other artists and scholars had uh, at the end of last year. And um, uh, so this is an opportunity to continue that. And it's really an opportunity to continue um, a long-standing conversation around these questions that we pursued with Julie in many locations over many, over many occasions many cities over the years and um it's a pleasure so we'll do our best given the discombobulating circumstances so um this text is called um, notes towards julie moretu's project of abstraction a poetics of suggesture that's suggesture s-u-g-g-e-s-t-u-r-e and aesthetics of visual neologism. Uh, and it's in four parts. So we think it will take about 15 to 17 minutes to read. Um, so this is part zero, um, a poetics of the proleptic and aesthetics of the prospective. In an essay on Julie Moretti's work entitled Signature Measures, Julie Moretti's Disfigurations, author Marina Warner quotes an email from Julie Moretti from March 2017. <clears throat> In this email, Julie Moretti writes, The need for neologisms in abstraction and says that she is ripping off the idea of visual neologisms in abstraction, figuration, drawing, reinvention, invention, from marks known well, but can't, haven't been enough. This notion 
of visual neologism is Moretu's formulation for the invention of marks, which constitute a project of abstraction, a project for the making of gestures that propose abstraction, a project for a gestural inventivism that sets abstraction in play. It's a formulation of gestures in relation to the presence, the simultaneous present, the trans-historical presence of the history of artistic gestures of abstraction. It points to the metamorphic instability of the making of gestures in the present of painting. It's not only that visual neologisms set abstraction in motion, it's that abstraction relies upon visual neologism to chart the prospective tensions of its figurative possibilities. So we can think of visual neologisms as figures in and of abstraction, figures whose discrepant relation to abstraction reconfigures and disfigures, that is to say, queers abstraction's potential. In 2020, in conversation with journalist Mark Benjamin, Moretu states that, I keep thinking that in the way that I'm working, my mark making kind of evolves out of gesture. It mimics all of this history of mark making, whether it is prehistoric or really recent. All of that informs how I keep working, how I keep imagining, how I keep seeing. There are moments when I look at something that looks somewhat like this Dustin arm, but it morphs into the vitriolic tongue of bacon. Part of it is like Hammond's body print that stretches into a Giacometti, or is it a Nagotchi figure? You see all this stuff evolving and painting pulls from all of these languages in our history. I think of them all as visual neologism. A neologism comes around when you need to invent a new word because the language you have at hand is not enough. It doesn't describe fully a new emergent culture that's being formed on the fringes. We invent new names for new songs, new forms of music, or new ways of thinking, or new ways of being in the world. So that's kind of how I play with the mark. They are being stretched and formed and pulled to mimic certain parts of early Renaissance painting. in terms of Marx, protruding into extreme forms of Afrofuturist possibility. Then there are all these other elements that are fused back onto them. It is like quoting something, but then twisting it and shifting it into something else. When you make up a new word, you're actually using part of the meaning of that word, but you're making something new up as an indicator, a signifier of something else the way any neologism does. In invoking the idea of the citational capacity of the visual neologism, its citational temporality of the perspective, Moretu draws upon the textual, the musical, the sonic, the verbal, and the literary. Drawing upon the writing of the music writer, critic Ian Penn, we could call Gili Moretu's emphasis on the prolep proleptic capacity of the visual neologism, a poetics of suggestion. In his essay, Garvey's Ghost, Heidegger's Geist from 2000, Penman writes the, follows, the following. How did something so local and specific as Jamaican Dar become so generally accessible and amenable to quotation? And can one so easily assume the other's tone? How does anyone come to quote an ambiguously instrumental suggestion in the first place? The suggestion for Penman has to do with Dub's challenge to the division between the song 
and the instrumental by its invention of the version which is neither song nor instrumental, but a version, strictly one version of the truth. Molecular reconfiguration of time and manipulation of space that transcends criticism presiding tenets of realism. How do you quote an echo or a silence? Those are two ways of characterizing Ian Penman's project. One way of characterizing Moretti's project is its quest to draw out the prepositional capacities for suggestion made possible by a gesture, the gesture's capacity for suggestion. One, a poetics of the potential, a poetics of the not yet. What is important to Julie Reitu is the temporal and existential necessity of the visual neologism, a visuality which includes all of its avatars. It is the pressures of the present that require the invention, the construction, or the fabulation of a new gesture or a new mark. A new logism is summoned by the felt need of a gap between an experience and its available vocabulary. A discrepancy between a sensorial or phenomenal event and the inadequacy and insufficiency of everyday or specialist languages. A neologism is a nominative gesture for an experience that is a social experience in solution. To quote Raymond Williams, that has not yet crystallized into vocabulary or solidified into terminology. A neologism is not so much a name for an act as an effort to name the contours of the gradient of emergence. It is a gesture of and for and in which, and in that which is not yet, but which is and which will be in its prefix and its suffix. It is, in, it is a syntactical chimera whose potentialities are transmedial. Two, faced with visual neologisms, interpretation resorts to ekphrasis. What is clear is that visual neologism poses a challenge for interpretation, which as a result, resorts to ekphrasis. As Marina Warner writes, Energetic interlacing, arcs and trails, strokes and lines have characterized the artist's herb over the last three decades. Volatile, dynamic, layered reticulations tilt the plane and stir up illusory vortices from the surface of the painting into which we, the viewers, find ourselves plunging to be flung into space, our own compass, bearing, tipped, and changed. Three, in its encounter with visual neologism, interpretation turns towards analogy panic and illusional deficit. Visual neologism sets interpretation in an onto a mode of analogical multiplication, analogical ruse, analogical lure that could be, but do not have to be written in a mode of panic. It might not be analogy panic as much as an illusional deficit that can be characterized, at least in its initial phases, as a desire to generate inadequate comparisons, insufficient correlations, and inexact parallels. Visual neologisms invite your optic nerve into an encounter in which the percept, 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 sorry, perceptual acts of viewing, watching, identifying, encounter trouble, disambiguating phenomena for which they have no precise precedent. The, impre the, Im the imprecision of precedence poses problems for definition and pleasures for thought. 
a poetics of not yet. A poetics of the apathetic. A poetics of black blacklessness. If, vigi if visual neologism, very hot here, is characterized by its citationality and by its perspective significations, a spectator's initial encounter tends towards that of the not yet, the void of the potential. Visual neologism stages an encounter with abstraction's capacity to deracinate, with abstraction's capacity to redraw the lines that secure the aesthetic integrity of the histories of blackness. Visual neologism confronts us with an encounter with blacklessness. Visual neologism confronts us with what Catherine McKittrick calls blacklessness. In demonic grounds, black women and the cartographies of struggle, Catherine McKittrick points to the element of surprise that, quote, holds Black Canada in tension with the nation's ceaseless outlawing of blackness. Blackness is surprising because it should not be here, wasn't it here before, was always here, is only momentarily here, was always over there, beyond Canada, for example. This means then that black people in Canada are also presumed surprises because they are, quote, not here and, quote, here simultaneously. They are, comma, like blackness, unexpected, shocking, concealed in the landscape of systemic blacknessness. And they exist in the landscape of blacknessness and have astonishingly rich lives which contradict the essential black subject. The black surprise announces how blacklessness blackens geography in ways that are, depending on perspective, unintelligible. The black surprise, the blacklessly black, ideally welcomes a long, a long standing diasporic presence that cannot be understood on the geographic terms that make them possible. To regard Julie Moreto's visual neologisms as a blackening of the history of abstraction that makes black abstraction possible, but which cannot comprehend it, is to draw attention to the absented presence of the black blacknessness of Moreto's poetics of abstraction, with marks whose gesturality appears bereft of the historical gestures that secure the parameters of the racial regime's representation. What David Barrett suggests is, quote, a struggle not over representation, but with the racial limits of the representable as such. The psychic experience of the encounter with the blacklessness of abstraction, with marks that exceed recognition or identification or predication as blackness as blackness leads to a recursive insight into the borders that draw the lines which divide the presupposed limits of aesthetics capacity to bear the signs of blackness. This apprehension of transgression opens the confrontation with Julie Moreto's visual neologisms. It is the capacity of Moreto's abstraction to stage the blackness, the blackness of blacklessness. What remains to be specified is the specific blackness. What remains to be specified is the specific blackness that predicates this precise blacklessness. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you, Julie. Here we are. Can you hear me? Yes, yes great. I'm a neuroscientist and I work on the senses. And let me tell you that today's event has been a magical treat 
to our senses. So thank you to all the speakers so far because it's been nothing short of extraordinary. Now, what the hell am I doing here? Now, I understand. Now, you know, why would you have a scientist here? Now, I debated on the subject of my talk. In fact, a number of people asked me, what am I going to talk about? And decided to present a part of our research that I think uh, we can all connect to. Now, let me tell you that after hearing all of the amazing talks before, I feel simply inconsequential. Now, the subject of our work for today is the neural basis of our insatiable appetite for sugar. Now, I'm gonna talk about the science behind, and so you'll have to indulge me as I take you through a journey of experiments using animal models, all right? Now, in the 1800s, the average American consumed approximately seven pounds of sugar a year. Today, that number is well over 120 pounds. Now, we, my laboratory, works on the taste system. And we use it as a platform to understand how detection, your tongue, is transformed into perception, your brain, to guide actions and behaviors. Now, previously, we identified the receptors and the cells in your tongue that detect all five basic taste qualities. Sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and umami. Umami is a Japanese word that means yummy, delicious, and it's the taste of amino acids. And in the case of humans, one amino acid in particular, monosodium glutamate. It turns out that the entire taste universe has a palate of only five components. Now, these receptors are expressed in our taste cells, which themselves are found, let me make a little pointer here, which are themselves found on taste buds. And so what we have are sweet cells, sour cells, bitter cells, salty cells, and umami cells. Now, when a sweet receptor is activated on a sweet cell, then what you have is a sweet, a sweet signal that initiates in your tongue, and then it travels through multiple brain stations to finally reach the cortex, in this case, the mouse's cortex, where now the brain imposes meaning on that signal. Ooh, this is delicious. Oh, this is sweet. Oh, this is bitter. Now, it turns out that these receptors themselves play a key role also in our innate preferences to various tastes. And in fact, differences in the receptors between and within species underlie taste preference differences. And let me illustrate this with one experiment. It turns out that mice like the good life, like we do. And if you give mice a choice of a whole range of sweet tasting chemicals, they respond very robustly. What you're measuring simply here is how much they drink of it. And you could see that they drink a fair amount of sucralose, that's Splenda, they love it, sucrose, that's sugar, saccharin, and this here is the preferred sweetener used in the UK. Now, let me add that it tastes horrible. <laughs> that goes to show that Brits have no taste. Now, what's remarkable is that aspartame, which is the most prominent sweetener in the Western world, is completely undetected by mice. You see, they are completely blind to it. So we reason that perhaps this taste preference difference between human and mice are due to the corresponding receptors. And then we did the obvious experiments. We went into the human genome, identified the human sweet receptors, and then genetically engineer a mouse 
where we introduce the human receptor into the mice, and lo and behold, completely humanized this mouse's taste preferences. So this is the mice before, it has no sensitivity to aspartame, and this is now the mouse with the human receptor. So then how does the tongue know what it's tasting? Is that for me? <laughs> Tell them I'm busy, please. <laughs> it's on the outside pocket. I mean, this is horrible. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, how awkward is this, yes? All right, so, so then how does the tongue know what it's tasting? Well, it's very simple. All it needs to know is what receptor and what cell got activated. But how does the brain know what the tongue knows? Now, many years ago, my laboratory developed a way to actually look at the representation of taste qualities in the brain of a mouse. And in essence, what we do is we create a tiny little window into its brain with a very unique type of microscope. And now we challenge the animal with various tastes, and we see what gets activated in its cortex. And we came up with an unexpected finding. And the finding was that when we look, for example, at bitter taste, it turns out to be represented by a unique group of neurons at the very back of this area of the cortex. And when we look at sweet, it was a completely different area. And when we look at salt, it was yet a different area. In essence, generating a map. Here we have a common subject with today's many talks. A topographic map of taste qualities in our brain. Now, if in fact this group of neurons here represent the taste of bitter in your brain, and this group of neurons represent the taste of sweet in your brain, there are two predictions. The first prediction is that if I go to your brain and I silence these neurons so I prevent them from being activated, I should be able to give you all the sweet you want in your tongue, and you'll never know you had it. And that's exactly what you get, and that's exactly what we did with mice. Now, I want to tell you, however, the more interesting experiment, which is the second part which is I should be able then also to go, let's say, to these neurons in your brain, activate them, and you're going to think you're tasting bitter, even though I'm giving you absolutely nothing. Now, this only poses one small technical challenge, which is how do we activate a selective group of neurons in an animal's brain? And it turns out that you know if technology evolves, and over the past few years, there's been the development of a unique family of light-activated switches, just like a light switch, that we can introduce into any neuron we want. And then by simply using light, we can turn those neurons either on or off. So we take a mouse, we go into the area, for example, that represents the taste of bitter, introduce these molecular switches, and then we put a light fiber right over this area, and then we turn the light on. And that will activate these neurons. And if, in fact, this represents the sense of taste, then the mouse should react correspondingly. Now, let me show you now two clips as to what bitter and then sweet taste to a mouse. So uh, here's a mouse. This mouse has been trained. It has a little light fiber that goes into the area of the brain that represents bitter taste. And it's been trained to drink. It's very thirsty from this little water spout here when the little yellow light comes on. And you'll see the little yellow light will come on right there. And the mouse goes on then to lick from this water spout. It's very motivated because it's very thirsty. And this is kind of a reward for the mouse. And these three are just the control trials. Now the Trials that follow are trials where when the mouse is leaking, we activate the bitter cortex. Now, trial number one. <laughs> I mean, every time I see this, it's like, it yes, it kills me. It, trial number two. And the next trial that comes now is a trial where we put a lot of light. This mouse, it's cleaning its mouth of a non-existing fictive bitter taste. This is what abstraction 
is actually all about. <laughs> now, here you are. You activate 100 neurons out of 100 million neurons in the brain of this mouse. And this mouse thinks, believes, and feels as if it's tasting a bitter stimuli. Now, what about sugar? And this will get us to the subject of our, the main key of our, my presentation. Now, for sweet, we have to do something slightly differently. Here, we use a sated animal, a mouse that's not interested in drinking anything. But if it doesn't want to drink anything, it's never going to perform. And so we train them to sample once a while, because maybe something good will happen. But the key is the following. Now the light is in the sweet cortex, not in the bitter cortex, but the light is under leak control. And so in a few trials, we turn the light under leak control, the mouse will leak. And if it lacks, and if it likes what it feels, what will it do? It will want to continue leaking. And in essence, it will self-stimulate. This is what we call a closed loop. And so here is the mouse. The laser is off, not very interested in leaking. A leak here and there, not much interest. Laser comes on, and this mouse leaks and leaks and leaks and leaks this water until the laser goes off. Laser is off again, zero interest. Laser now goes under leak control, and this animal self-stimulates and continues to drink and drink exactly as this was sugar. But all we have here, of course, is just water. I think together, these experiments provide a powerful demonstration on how it's possible to control our sensory percepts and behavioral actions in the complete absence of all external sensory inputs. Now, when we did these experiments with Sweet, something unexpected happened. We kept trying the mouse, and eventually the mouse came back and reported back you're not going to fool me. There is not sugar there. And it stopped performing. So that said, then, our quest to understand what are the neural bases for our unquenchable appetite for sugar. It clearly cannot be activating the sweet cortex. And now let me illustrate the issue. If you take a naive mouse and you give a mouse an option to drink from a bottle containing a huge concentration of an artificial sweetener, and a normal amount of natural sugar, where this is around 10 times sweeter than this, this naive mouse, I had my mask hanging the whole time and nobody said anything. <laughs> it, and this naive mouse will innately, of course, drink from the sweeter thing. So if we have little electronic leak counters here, it, you could see that this mouse drinks only, this, each of this line is a, is a leak count, drinks almost exclusively from the gray bottle. And why? Because that's 10 times sweeter than the sugar on the other side. That's our innate drive. But if we now take this mouse, we bring it back to its home cage, and we expose it to the same amount of natural sugar they had in that bottle overnight, and we come back and we test it the next day, something magical, extraordinary happened. This mouse is now completely switched its preference so that it drinks almost exclusively from the sugar, even though it's 10 times less sweet than the, than the artificial sweetener. What's even more unexpected is that we can engineer a mouse where we eliminate all sweet receptors from the tongue. So these animals are taste blind. And when we repeat the same experiment in these taste blind animals, that of course cannot taste the sugar or the sweetener, we find exactly the same results. So in essence, these animals learn to recognize and choose the sugar, most likely as a result of a very strong post-ingestive effect. So the mice are saying, I have no idea what's in there, but it makes me feel good. And that's what I want. And so we reason there has to be a brain basis for this behavior. What's driving the mice to ultimately choose what they learn to recognize as making them feel good, even though it's 10 times less sweet than the other option? And so we have means to then to treat mice with water, with sucrose, sugar, or sweetener, and ask what is activated in the brain 
only in response to sucrose, but not to water or to sweetener. And the technology that allows you to do that, and the key here is that there is a unique area in the brain that's very strongly activated by sugar, but not by water or sweetener. Now, what's unique about this area is known as the nucleus of the solitary tract, is that uh, that is the primary target of the gut-brain axis. And the gut-brain axis is a, a two-way highway of nerve signals transferring information from every one of your internal organs and your internal state into the brain. In fact, what we know now is that the gut ends up being actually your second brain. We have hundreds of millions, actually the number is you know, 300 million neurons innervating our gut. It, more importantly, this connectivity path appears to be the major way that the brain understands the state of your entire body. So we reason that maybe then sugar is having its effect via the gut-brain axis. And ingested sugar is acting on the gut to transfer a signal to the brain that now drives motivation, consumption, um, the rewarding response, addiction, and so forth. And so if this is true, there is a clear prediction. And the prediction is that if I can go into a mouse and genetically engineer it, so I silence these vagal neurons, these gut-to-brain neurons, I should be able to give it all the sugar you want. And the mice will never develop a preference for sugar. Make sense? And that's precisely what we did. And that's precisely what you get. This is a normal mouse. After you've been exposed at first with the two, and then you put it only with sugar, and then you come back the next day, remember you switch that you only drink sugar. You see, this mice drinks only glucose, pretty much, versus ASK. But if you repeat the same experiment I described to you in mice where we silence the gut-brain axis, that means we prevent synaptic transmission from the gut to the brain. Now, these mice are completely incapable of developing preference for sugar. And in essence, they still continue to like the artificial sweetener versus the sugar. Now, three significant findings emerge out of this work. The first, they illustrate that the conventional view of the sugar addiction cycle where sugar was thought to go into the circulation and then act on brain circuits, it's incorrect. In fact, the physiological driver of sugar preference formation is the signal through the gut-brain axis. Second, they uncover these two parallel pathways for our attraction to sugar. And most importantly, highlight the fundamental difference between liking and wanting. Liking is what the tongue and the taste system does. Mm -mm, this is good. This is nice. But wanting is what the gut-brain axis mediates. They also illustrate why artificial sweeteners have failed in the market in curving our addiction for sugar. And the reason they have failed is because they only work on this pathway. They only operate in the tongue pathway, not on the gut brain. So they never curve our insatiable, unquenchable appetite for sugar. And the last point I want to bring up, since I'm out of time, is that they uncover, I think, the profound implications of the gut brain axis as a way of accessing and modulating brain circuits without ever having to go into the brain per se. So when you think that you had a gut feeling, you actually had a gut feeling. So let me conclude by thanking the people in my laboratory that have done all this work, an amazing group of graduate students, PhDs, and PhD MDs that went on to do this work. 
And of course, finally, I need to, of course, thank Julie <laughs> for the privilege of being part of this celebration of her amazing work. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> Thank you, Robin, Fumi, Kojo, and Anjali, and Charles. That was an incredible group of thoughts and ideas. And really, I just learned a lot, really, in general. Um, I'm now very, very honored to introduce Dr. Bianca Marlin. She is a neuroscientist, the Herbert and Florence Irving Assistant Professor of Cell Research, the Principal Investigator of the Marlin Lab at Columbia University Zuckerman Institute. Her research focuses on how trauma in parents affects the brain structure and sensory experience of their future offspring. She received the Donald B. Lindsley Prize in Behavioral Neuroscience from the Society for Neuroscience in 2016 and was named a Stat Wonderkind in 2017. She's also a member of the Next Generation Leaders Council at the Allen Institute, holds a PhD in neuroscience from NYU School of Medicine and dual bachelor degrees in biology and adolescent education from St. John's University. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you very much. And thank you, Julie, for having me here today. Um, I, I, you don't have to ask uh, what the hell am I doing here because uh, Charles already answered that question for you. So I'm also a neuroscientist um, at Columbia University, and my work surrounds senses as well. Um, and uh, we just heard about uh, taste, but we have to ask, what is taste without smell? So I'm an olfactory neuroscientist, and I use smell as well as taste and, um, and hearing to parse out the representation of the environment in the brain, not just in the brain as we stand here today, but in the historical brain, the brain of our ancestors and how that can live on in us in the realm of trauma. So the good book says, to train up a child in the way that it should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. It's a representation of parenthood, something my work directly focuses on. The role of parents, of caregivers, and imparting into their offspring a way for them to survive and thrive in the world. And in the canonical sense, we have parents who will be with their children all the time, teach them right from wrong so that they can live in the world and be successful members of society. But that can't always be the case. Your parents cannot always be with you. Those that came before you cannot always be with you. And I think what my research has been able to show is that there's a beautiful way for that impartment to be maintained in the body and be maintained in the mind. And that's what I'll show you a little bit about here. Um, and a lot of this work is motivated by a direct study with humans surrounding something called the Dutch Hunger Winter. So the Dutch Hunger Winter occurred after the, the, the last winter of World War II, when the Netherlands were cut off from food for protesting against transport of Nazi troops. They were not allowed to have food come in. And here's a picture that I took from the New York Times in which um, a, 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 a allied country is dropping food into the Netherlands. During this time of nine months, the Netherlands were starved. Many people died. They were forced to eat food, um, bricks and uh, wood as food. Um, and the kind soldiers that happened to be around did, um, did uh, offer food. And it's a side project in the lab that um, my graduate student, Becca, who's here today, is actually interviewing two people who survived the Dutch hunger winter who are in their 80s now and the experience that has and that lives on in them. Uh, what's exciting about these, the, the unfortunate time, but what's exciting about this is researchers observed that after the Dutch hunger winter, the children and the grandchildren of those who suffered the Dutch hunger winter suffered from metabolic issues, hypertension, high blood pressure, um, diabetes, even schizophrenia. It's as if the memory of this starvation period lived on in the kids and the grandkids of those who suffered from the Dutch hunger winter preparing them for a land where there was no food, even though they were living in the land of plenty. And this led to the hypertension and um, diabetes, high blood pressure, and, um, and potentially even tied in with schizophrenia. I don't look at humans. These are the children that I study. So these are my mice pup um, that I study in the lab. And I use the odors as a way to um, parse into the brain. And so here's a, a schematic drawn by my, uh, my 
undergraduate technician, Yasmin, who's also here today. And what we have here is a representation of sorts of the main olfactory epithelium. These are the first cells in the nose that smell an odor. So any, the, the perfume of your lover, the smell of the coffee in the back that alerts your attention. These are the first neurons in the nose that sense those odors. And uh, the Nobel Prize went to a, a, my mentor, who discovered that for each one of these cells, it only expresses one receptor, and that one receptor is what it lives with for the rest of its life. And all of those receptors will go to one place called the glomerulus, because neurons speak to each other through this arborization, this beautiful tree branching in which they connect with one another, and that's how communication is passed through. And so what we do in the lab is we present an odor. In this case, I will present the odor of a flower, and we traumatize the animal by a light foot shock. I'll represent as here. And what we then can go do is observe the main olfactory epithelium. So this is an actual main olfactory epithelium in which we have the cells here and their projections, the message that they can send into the glomerulus. As beautiful as this image, um, uh, as, as a olfactory neuroscientist, I, th I think it's gorgeous. As beautiful as, as this image is, it doesn't allot for our ability to really look into the nooks and crannies of the setup to see what's happening to the nose when an odor is presented with something traumatic like a shock. So what we do is we perform something called iDisco. It's a way of taking the brain tissue, setting it in agar, as shown here, and then clearing away all of the fat so that we're only keeping the cell structure and then we can look at single cells without there being bone or fat in the way. So this is a, ooh, pardon. Okay, well that was a before and after. I don't know how to go back, but you saw that you could actually see through the entire tissue. Thank you very much. It's right here. So the tissue is still embedded in this agar, but we can see straight through it. So we can now image it using something called a light sheet microscope. And here's a representation, a, a, an actual image of a glomerulus after it's been cleared. And what we're now able to do is look at this, this chunk of tissue, but really zoom in and be able to observe the, this arborization, this message that can be passed into the, into the parts of the brain. We can look at these uh, glomeruli, and we also can then fill them out and see how big they are and look at the beautiful, the beautiful arborization. But what is this information without going back to the question of how does trauma paired with an odor change this representation in the brain? And so what I have here is a clear brain sample and the cells that are in blue, the little dots are in blue, uh, respond to flower, the flower odor, and the dots that are in green respond to the smell of almond. We're able to parse out the different odors in between the nose to observe if we present almond and shock or odor with shock, what possibly could happen. And excitingly, what we uh, discovered, and, um, and as well as other labs, what we were able to follow up on is that the traumatic experience of shock paired with an odor somehow increases the number of cells that respond to that odor. These are first order neurons. They're not going into parts of the brain that say, I'm scared, or run. These are the first neurons that respond to a smell, and somehow they gain the information that says, this is important, and I am now going to increase my cell number for survival. I'm showing you two graphs. You only have to look at two bar graphs, but these two bar graphs hold a wealth of information. These two first bars are the amount of cells normally in the nose of a mouse that respond to the paired odor in home and in unpaired, which is when I present an odor. Ten, uh, 60 seconds later, I present the shock. So they're not co-terminating. The animal stress, but there's no um, association with the odor. However, when we have an odor for 10 seconds and it ends with a shock, there's an increase in cell number. The neurons somehow remember that this was a traumatic event. What we found to be astounding was that this message is not something that's just maintained in that animal who experienced this light foot shock in the odor. The offspring of these animals who have never experienced the odor that their parents were shocked with are born with a different brain, are born with cells that are increased 
to that ancestral odor without ever experiencing it. Where does the memory of this trauma reside? The fact that there's an increase within the nose, that somehow this is informing the body, informing the sex cells. And in this study, we only looked at males, therefore informing the sperm and passing that on to the second generation. It was a lot for um, the, lab, the lab to tune. This is what we're doing right now in the lab, parsing this through. And um, what you see here, hopefully you can see here, um, is our ability to actually look at the birth date of cells, so the cells that are in red. Um, oh, it's a little bit hard to see, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to this, the salacious data. What I'm showing you here, you have to believe me because you can't see it as beautiful um, on the screen, is that we have cells that we can label the birth date of cells, when our cells are being born. We want to ask, how is there an increase in cell number in the nose? And what our data showed, here's a, a still image of this, is that the cell that's in green responds to the paired odor, the shocked odor. And when it's co-labeled with this red, it means it was born after the presentation of shock and odor. This means that the neurons are saying, I've been shocked with this odor. I'm now going to increase the number of cells that represent this odor. New cells that are born are now going to choose that receptor. And I'm using words that anthropomorphize um, uh, these neurons. I'm not sure if they're actually saying, what am I going to be today? I think, I think I'll be an almond odor. Um, but the fact that they are able to increase specifically to the paired odor is a beauty of biology. And here's a zoomed in image in which we see this one neuron who prior was responding, didn't exist prior because we're looking at the birth date, like this animal, like this neuron, now is in, um, expressing the red, which means it was born after the shock, and the green, which means it's, par it's partial to that paired odor. We spoke about um, how this can happen in the nose. How does it get to the second generation? This is another type of imaging that we do in the lab. Um, this is called taking a video from your iPhone uh, of a sperm that I took from a mouse um, that was anesthetized with a syringe. So we can look at different time points during this traumatic experience and other traumatic experiences we put the mice through, um, light traumatic experiences, to look at the genetic and epigenetic, meaning around the genome, factors that could lead to this increase in cell number in the second generation, that can lead to the diabetes, hypertension, and schizophrenia in the second and third gener generation of those who went through a traumatic experience. And similar to what um, uh, Charles's lab does, we also can image neurons in the brain. And what we are imaging here is an area in the brain called the amygdala, which represents fear. And we're able to look not at the first generation that was paired with the shocked odor, but at the second generation, the sun, present the odor that its parent was shocked with, and observe changes in the fear centers of their brain. Do these animals respond in a, in a matter of fear to an ancestral memory. And that's the animal um, smelling and walking on the ball. And we can see a lighting of a cell here and here in response to these odors in the fear centers. And so what the lab uh, is looking forward to uncovering is how does a message, a memory of a stressful event go across the cell across space from the nose to the testes and across time to the second generation. And one piece that um, came from, uh, that uh, Julie uh, uh, walked me through um, as of recent was the Hakka and Riot. And um, from what it was explained to me, this was motivated by an image of children on the border of the United States and Mexico and in California, who were separated from their parents. And although day to day as scientists, we walk into the lab and we look at a mouse and we have a light foot shock and we present an odor, and we look at changes in the nose, we take a step back and look at how our science affects humanity and how decisions that humanity make can affect generations. It's sometimes hard to parse that out by looking at a single red cell. But if you think that a light foot shock and a smell of a flower can change the brain of an animal, not just that animal, but for generations, what can more traumatic events do over time? 
And what does that look like, not just for the individual, but for society? This work is motivated by these two people. Um, you can tell by the amount of alcohol in the back that this is obviously my first birthday. Um, <laughs> this is me. And these are my parents, my mom and dad. My mom and dad are my, my biological parents, um, and I'm always moved um, speaking about them. They were foster parents. So I grew up with foster siblings, although they're my bi biological parents. And through um, interactions that I had with my siblings, I heard of traumas that children had gone through that led them into the foster care system. It was only now as a, a neuroscientist, and I see where my, my science brings me, that I realized that they are the motivation behind my work, and I would be remiss not to thank them every time for sharing their experiences with me so that I can think of them in a way every time I present this work to motivate um, what we need to do as a society and as neuroscientists to bring more information to light. Um, and I think about them every time because um, they are the embodiment of uh, Americans, of black Americans. And um, my mother, an immigrant from South America, my dad, a black American, um, took in other children who were dealing with their queer identities where their parents couldn't, um, dealing with the um, oppression that comes with uh, being a other in the United States of America um, and having your children separated from you. It goes both ways. And so um, I'm just always motivated by um, the work that they did that allowed me to be where I am. And I also think about these two little ones, my kids. Because although you, there may be epigenetic markers that I can only control so much, we know that these markers come with experience. And that's something that we can control as humanity. We can control the way we interact with each other. We can control the way we interact with the world. And that can change the world for generations. And with that, I'd like to thank the amazing, brilliant scientists who do this work, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Marlin. Um, I think we all learned so much, and thank you so much for sharing photos of your family, because yeah, it is why we do all of these things. And I think there's so much to be said for bringing our truths into these spaces. So thank you for that, for your vulnerability. And thank you to your parents.